Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video I want to introduce you to key paths and how you can use them in your SwiftUI projects. We'll start by looking at what a key path is and how you can use them to reference a property of an object or a struct, and then look at some examples of how you might apply them in your code. This will include using key paths for sorting and mapping arrays. We'll look at the dynamic member lookup attribute and two very practical examples for using key paths to simplify your code. And then we'll finish with a short explanation of how key paths are used for lists in SwiftUI. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. I've created a sample project for this video and I recommend that you download it from the link in the description. There are different pages covering each of the different topics that I refer to in the introduction. Make sure that you set the pages to view rendered markup so that you can easily navigate between the pages. Once completed, you'll have a reference to go back to in the future. Now a key path is a type and it represents a reference to properties and subscripts of an object. And the basic syntax is a backslash followed by the type name, a period followed by the path. In the next section, we'll take a look at how we can access nested properties via a path or a dynamic member lookup, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It's actually a pretty simple concept as I'll show you here. And you may initially wonder, what is it good for? Because there's easier ways to accomplish what we're showing you right here. But hang in there, I'll show you. So consider this struct for wine. I've also created two constants, one for a favorite wine and another for wines. That's an array of three wine objects. To create a key path for the winery property of a wine object, we'll start with the backslash followed by the type, which is the root, which is a wine, and then a period followed by the property, which is winery. Now, if we option click on the constant name, we'll see that the key path is a legitimate type and it's shown like this. It's a writable key path where wine is the root or type and string is the value type. The fact that it's writable means that we can read and write to the property at this path. If we change the var to a let and we option click again, this time we see that it's simply a key path and it is read only. So if we're going to be changing this value in this next example, we'll have to change it back to a var. To access the value of the instance of that object at that key path, we use the instances subscript where we can pass in the key path like this. Now I created a key path property here because I want to show you what that syntax is for the key path, but I didn't really need to do that. I could simply enter the key path directly as the subscripts key path. When we apply a key path to a known type where fav type is a wine, we can omit the type and simply specify the path. So backslash dot winery. As we saw, our key path is writable. So we can update our property using the key path as well. In this second example, we'll want to update the value for our favorite wine's price. Well, we can do the same as before by creating a key path for that property. And then we can set the value at the key path. And we'll set it to $35. And then if we print it out using the favorite wine's key path, we see that it's been updated. Also, like before, though, we can simply jump to entering the key path directly. And because it understands that favorite wine is actually a wine root, we can omit the wine as the root and simply just use backslash dot price. Now at this point, you're probably wondering, well, this is pretty useless. I can access and update my properties using good old dot notation. And I'd agree. I never access simple properties or update properties like this using key paths, but bear with me. I wanted to show you what a key path is and how you can declare it as a type. 
and use it, which means we could also pass them around and use them as arguments in functions, which is really interesting. But we'll get there. In this article by Sarun, he goes into much more depth about the definition of key paths and how there are actually five different types of key paths. And I'm just focusing on the three basic ones. We have seen writable key path and key path. And the third one is the key path for a class instead of a struct. It's a reference type. I'm more focused here on usage of key paths, but if you're interested in more in the details, I highly recommend this post. And I'll leave a link in the description. So let's focus on a couple of simple examples where key paths can make our life a lot easier, and that's where we sort arrays of objects. Take, for example, our array of wine. And let's say I want to sort those wines by winery. Well, the traditional way is to use the sorted method on an array like this using the sorted by method. And this takes a closure and it returns an array of wines like this. We have wine one and wine two, and we do a comparison for wine one dot winery is less than wine two dot winery. And then I can loop through that wine for each wine in the sorted winery and print the wine dot winery. We could also simplify this using shorthand notation, where we can replace the wine and wine one simply with dollar zero and dollar one. I have a complete set of videos on higher order functions if this syntax is confusing to you, so I recommend that you watch them if you want to. I'll leave links in the description. Well, now using key pass, we can use a different sorted method. Instead of using the sorted by method, we'll use the sorted using method on an array. And that accepts a sort comparator. This sort comparator can be a key path comparator. And that has a single argument, namely the key path that we want to sort on. So in our case, that will be by the wine.winery key path. But again, since our method is being applied to an array of wine, we don't need to specify the root wine, just the path to that property, which is dot winery. Another example here demonstrates an additional argument that we can pass into the sorted method, and that is order. This is an enum that has either forward or reverse, and it's forward by default, which is what we accepted in our last example. So we want to sort our wines on price, then we can again use the sorted method on wines using that key path comparator. But if I hold the option key down, I get the ability to enter the order argument as well, and we'll specify reverse. So if we print this array out again, printing out the variety and the price this time, and then execute the playground, we can see that it's been sorted descending by price. The map function on an array is the best way to extract all the values from a particular property in an array of objects on its own in array. Well, the map function accepts a closure and it provides us with an iterator of the array type that we can use in the body to extract what we want to have in our array. In this case, we want just the varieties values. So let's print that out. Again, if we wanted to, we could shorten that mapping using $0 syntax, but I'll leave that up to you to explore. What I want to show you now, though, is that same as with sort, we can simplify this closure and replace it using a key path. Now there's no code completion showing here, however. We just have to know that instead of using braces, we'll replace with the parentheses and then simply specify our key path. Perfect. This works for flat map as well, and you could also use it with higher order filter functions if you want to filter out objects where a Boolean property of the object is part of that filter. You could also use computed properties to generate that Boolean property. Now remember when I started this video, I mentioned that we can use key paths to access properties of nested objects, like I have here on this page. I've got three structs, 
The first is a variety with two properties, one a string and another a type, which is an enum. And then the second for winery with two properties, and both of those are strings. And then a third called purchase that represents the purchase of a bottle of wine, and it has three properties, but two of the types are my user defined types of variety and winery. And I've created a single sample purchase. So in this first example, if I want to print out the winery name, I can do that without using a key path. I can simply use print sample purchase dot winery dot name. That's what we're all used to, and that's what I continue to do. It's pretty straightforward. Now, if I want to do this using a key path, I can do that too. Let me create a key path, and I'll specify that as a winery name key path, and the root will be purchase, and the path will be dot winery dot name. That value is just the path from purchase through winery to the name property. Of course, when we print this out, we can print the sample purchase using the subscript for key path, just as we've done before. However, we also know that since sample purchase is a purchase, which is the root, we can omit the root and not use or define the key path at all. I could take this winery name key path from here, though, and move it up and have it as a static property of our purchase object, like this. Because this is a static property of the purchase struct itself, instead of using purchase, we can use capital self to designate that it is the purchase. And then we can use this in our print statement in example three. Well, that's all fine and good, but it really doesn't give us much benefit. So enter dynamic member lookup. And this was introduced in Swift 5.1. And when a type conforms to the dynamic member lookup protocol, it gains the ability to access its members through dot syntax instead of the traditional getter and setter methods. So to use this feature, we have to define a subscript that takes a single parameter of type key path and returns the corresponding value of the member at runtime. Paul Hudson has a nice post on that topic. So I recommend that you take a look at that if you want some more detail. I'll leave a link in the description. So let's try this out here by applying this dynamic member lookup attribute to the purchase struct. When I do that, I get this error that the attribute requires purchase to have a subscript dynamic member method that accepts either an expressible by string literal or a key path. So what does that mean? Well, I have two properties that are user-defined types with properties of their own. So I'll need to create a subscript for whatever type that I want to access or drill down on. Now, since all of our winery properties are strings, this is easy. The key path types are all strings, and the value returned from the key path is a string as well for both cases. So if we create a subscript function using a dynamic member key path parameter, and it is a key path where the root is a winery and the value will be a string and it will return a string. Well, then we can use our key path to access that property. Now, when we want to print out our winery name and a winery country, for example, we can see that we now can avoid the use of key paths entirely or even multiple dots. My print statements, as you see here using dot notation, now display both the name and country as options. Well, that's wonderful. Well, what about variety, though? Its properties are different. One's a string, and the other is a wine type, that enu. So we can get around that forcing it a single type by using generics for this struct. And generic functions can work with any type, and a key path is a type as well. So still within the parent purchase struct, I'm going to create a new subscript function, but we're going to specify that we need to use generics here. So we'll use a placeholder between angle brackets 
and I'll use T to specify some generic type. And then for the key path, we'll need our root to be variety, but that type is going to be a generic T. And the return result will be that same generic type of T. And then we can access the key path for that variety. So back in example six then, we can print directly using our dot notation. The sample purchase dot classification shows up. I can use it. And then to print the sample purchases type, because it's an enum that is a, an associated type of string, we can use the raw value to print it out. On this page, I'd like to show you two powerful use cases. I have a sample product struct here that has three properties. The product name is a string, and there are a wholesale and retail price. Both are doubles. And I've also created an array of product that we can work with. If I want to determine the total wholesale value of all of the products, I can use a reduce function in Swift. Again, I have a video on this topic if this is new to you. It's a higher order function method that we can perform on an array of objects. This closure allows us to provide an initial value or a result, which is going to start at zero. And then the second parameter is a trailing closure that provides us with a next partial result. And it has two arguments. That partial result, which is the same type as our initial one, along with an iterator for our an array. So we can name that iterator as product. And then we can use both of these variables now in our closure. Well, that partial result starts at zero, and then we'll add the next property from our product and proceed through the array. And the property that we're interested in is the wholesale property. So this will sum up all of those values. Well, instead of using dot notation for the wholesale, let's use a key path. If we print the wholesale total, we get that sum. Well, this is great. But as you can see for the next example, we want to do the same for retail. Well, why don't we create a function for this in our product struct, a static function, that we can use for both of our key paths, because we can pass in a key path into our function. So I'll call this function total, and it will be passed in an array of products. So that's our first parameter. And then for the second parameter, we'll have to provide a key path that we want to perform the operation on. We'll both have the same root of product, and both of our types are doubles, so we can define the parameters type as a key path, root of product, value of double, and it will return another double. In the body of the function, then, we can use that same function that we created for our example. So in our example, then, to create our wholesale total, we'll access the static products function total, passing in our array of products for the key path wholesale. The second example then is going to be easy for our retail total. Again, we'll access the static products total function, passing in our array of products. This time, though, the key path will be retail. In the second example on this page, I've created a struct that represents a player in a game. And there are three properties, the player name, the score as an int, and a Boolean value representing whether or not the player is still participating or is playing in the game. I also have an array of players that represent a number of players participating in the game, and each one has a score, but only some of them are currently playing. When the game is over and I start a new game, we'll want to reset the scores for every player to zero and set is playing for all of them to be false. I want to create a single static function that we can pass in an array to, we'll make it mutable, 
And then we can specify a property that we want to reset using a key value, and then specify what value we'll have to apply for all of the values in that array. For example, when we start the game, we'll set is playing to true. So let's call this function reset, but the properties we want to reset aren't the same. One's an int, and the other one's a boolean. So we'll need to provide a type placeholder. Again, we'll use t. And we're going to pass in an array of players, which is fine, but we're going to mutate it in place. So we'll need to use the keyword in out. And in Swift, an in out is a keyword to use to indicate that a function's parameter can be modified inside the function, and those changes will be reflected outside of the function. Unlike a parameter, which is passed in by value, and any changes made inside the function won't be reflected outside of the function. Next, we specify that the key path, and since we're making changes this time, we can't use just straight key path because that's read only. It has to be that writable key path, which we saw in our first page. But the root is always going to be player, but the type is either an int or a bool, so we'll use that t placeholder. And we also specify that the value is going to be, which is a new value, and it's going to be of the same type. Now we have everything we need. We can loop through every player by using its index, which we can get by looping through the player's indices. And then we can access the player at that index, so player at index, and then using the key path subscript for the key path that we passed in, and set it to the new value. With that done then, let's put it to use. We can execute that static function on players to call the reset function, where we'll pass in our array of players, and since it's an in-out argument, we'll need to preface it with and, it's already there. To reset the score, we'll pass in the score key path and provide a new value of zero. To reset the is playing property on all players, We'll still pass in the array of players, but the key path this time will be is playing, and the new value will be the Boolean false. So, to prove that this works, if we loop through each player and print their name, score, and is playing properties, we'll be able to see if they were reset. They were. Perfect. For the final example, I want to quickly shed some light on the identifiable protocol and the ID property when we're creating lists in SwiftUI. I have a SwiftUI view for that same product and array of products that we used in the last example, along with that sample array, and I've also included that function that we created. I'll get to that shortly. First, let's replace the text view with a list using a range of numbers from 1 through 5. So we'll need to use an open range like this to print them out in a list. Item is our iterator as we go through, so we'll use string interpolation to print that item. Now I'm not sure what's going on with my SwiftUI playground pages in Xcode 14.3, but when I run the playground, the preview doesn't appear. I have to tap on this enable code review button and then back again before I tap on the play button before my view re-renders. You may not have to do this. You may notice that I'm missing in this example though, an ID property which you probably know lists must have to iterate through them. And the object has to be identifiable or have an ID property that we specify using an ID and a key path. Well, it turns out that because a range, all values are unique, we don't have to provide an ID key path. However, we can see that if we change this to an array using the same integers. We get an error, and that error is a result of it not knowing if that array is in fact unique or identifiable. There's no guarantee that those integers that I have in here are unique. So we have to guarantee that by specifying an ID for the object or a key path. 
And since this is a type, which is an int, and each int we're going to say is going to be unique, we can use self as the key path. So we just use dot self because it knows that the type is an int. And that displays property when I refresh the view. So let's go to our array of products. This struct does not conform to the identifiable protocol. So if I'm going to use this in our list, we would normally make this conform to the identifiable protocol. And I would have to add an ID property. Well, I don't want to do that. We can't use self, though, on an entire struct. So it has to be one of these properties that we're going to specify is our unique property. And I would think that this name is going to have to be unique. So I'm going to guarantee that. So let's update our list to display the product names along with the retail and wholesale prices. So we'll change this then to products. And then we'll have to specify the ID key path. So we'll specify name. And this time it'll give us a product that we can loop through. So I'm going to embed this in an H stack. I'm not going to worry about alignment or making it look pretty. And I'll create the text view with the product name. Then I'm going to follow this text view using another text view to provide the product retail. But it's a number. But we can use the format argument to specify that it is a currency type using the code USD for US dollars. And then I can copy and reuse that, but just change it to the product wholesale. Now at the end of the list, I can use our function to print out the total retail sales. And again, I'm going to specify that the format is a currency type using that same US dollar code. So we've generated our list without having to specify that our products is identifiable because we can choose a key path. So that's it for another video tutorial. I hope that like me, as I learned from researching this video, that key paths are very powerful and can help us simplify our code because they are just a type that can be passed into functions and can be used in Swift UI for identifiable objects. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment. This helps drive people to my channel. And also subscribe by tapping the subscribe button and enable notifications so that you'll find out when new videos drop. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you continue to watch and share my videos.